in our first down to business, I'm off to one of the top events in the social enterprise calendar, the World Forum on Social Entrepreneurship, held each year at Oxford University's Said Business School and funded by eBay billionaire Jeff Scholes Philanthropic Foundation. It was packed with over 800 leaders from the ethical business world. I managed to catch up with a few of them. Can we please get this for the BBC World sure. World Challenge sure. Series? We'd sure. love to hear your how, how did it all start? We literally had a napkin, and on the napkin we said there are about three things we need to do. We need to infiltrate the corridors of power. How better to do that than in a business school? We need to celebrate the work of these extraordinary people all over the world who are literally changing the world a bit at a time by taking market-like innovations to, to solve major market failures. Um, and we need to do some teaching and some research and get some people into business schools who wouldn't otherwise get this. And eight years later, we now have a thousand people in Oxford every year. And it's thanks to that conversation in that San Jose restaurant. Do you have the napkin? We don't. I don't have a napkin. Sally might have and, a and napkin. And he thinks it's a napkin. I think we were writing on the tablecloth. Actually, it was the tablecloth. <laughs> right, it was the tablecloth. The buzzword at Skoll is impact investment. But what does it mean? Elizabeth Littlefield enlightened me. We've launched today here at the Skoll Forum um, a call for funds for impact investors to come forth and, and bring their proposals to OPEC. And we are hoping that we can put 250 million, maybe more, dollars to work. We believe this, this impact investing sector has huge potential to grow because we believe that people out there in the world, the man on the street, really wants to see his money invested in a way that's consistent with his values as well as earning returns. And so we want to be able to help this sector grow. We want to take find ways to, to finance gaps in the sector, to reduce risk from the sector so that it can, it can grow and, and flourish. Next, I caught up with Nadine Kitani who runs an impact investment company focused on the Middle East. What are the types of investments that you're, that you're targeting? We are targeting um, investments in the healthcare sector, the food and nutrition sector, environment, education, housing, community housing, and general community development. And what types of segments of the population? Are these lower income groups? Is this housing for lower income, healthcare for lower income? Yes, it is, definitely. Um, lower income groups, but not, not, not only that. These are, our, our investments will go straight into businesses that um, deliver these solutions to um, anybody who needs it. So we are not only targeting the basic pyramid, as it's called, but um, also sort of higher up the economic ladder. Remember, in some countries in, in the MENA region, a GNI per um, capita is actually higher than in many, many other countries. It's just that the, the, the actual distribution um, of wealth that isn't quite as equitable as it should be. So for your business, what for you will be the critical drivers for your growth? Um, belief that, um, that this works. Belief that this is the, the, the future of investing and of responsible investing. And, um, and the, 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 what we really need now is um, effort put in by networks, um, governments, organizations, foundations to encourage the growth of social entrepreneurship, of entrepreneurship in the small and growing business sector. And what would sector. trigger that? Sorry? What would trigger that? Um, what would trigger the next wave of growth for you? Well, um, investment, political will, um, and, and, and a general sort of ed an education process. What is the synergy that will help you really go up to scale? If there's a couple of a couple of partnerships that would really big it up for you, what are they? Well, distribution is key. So, how do you how do you get that hardware out into the marketplace? So, how do you, you, know, what, you know, and you need to try lots of different distribution channels to get it right. What you've really got to do, and this is where Impesa was so successful, if you incentivize somebody else to become your sales agent for you, so in, in the Impesa case, which is a you know, big mobile payment scheme in Kenya, there are 22,000 places customers can go and do a cash in or a cash out. You need to take the elements of that and apply it into, an, in, in, into a, a, a proper solar model. So you need to have points of presence that customers can go to. They can go to them with, uh, with, to, to get interested in the product. They can go to them and, and, and get uh, 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 questions answered. They can go to them with problems. But you need to create a sort of distribution network of people.
you set up in Pez. It was yeah, your right, idea. Right. It was your brainchild. And it worked. And it's continuing to grow. Yeah. So give three top lessons for yeah. social entrepreneurs who want to make stuff work. Sure. Um, in, in, in a corporate organization, you need your air cover. So you've got to find somebody at a senior level in, in that organization who's going to back you, even if it's just a gut feel. Secondly, you need a team of good people. I had some fantastic people working in my team. We refused to lie down until we got MPESA to work. Yeah, and, and third and finally, and perhaps most importantly, don't be afraid of making mistakes. We made a bunch of mistakes with M-Pesa. And, you know, and, and but, you, but you have to work through those mistakes, and eventually you come up with a solution that works. And m is a great example. So, Brilliant, yeah. Nick. We better both run. Yeah, we better have, yeah, thanks. Really yeah, good yeah, to nice meet you. We'll be in touch with Fantastic. So all the talk here was of a new kind of capital. But Andrew Mitchell reckons the most important kind of capital, natural capital, just isn't getting enough attention. This is solid ground for World Challenge, and it was a chance for me to tell him about my recent report for the first down to business from the heart of the Colombian jungle. One of the interesting things I learned at this conference, and uh, I'll give you just a, a slightly different take on it, is that, um, because uh, social entrepreneurship is a bimodal thing. On the one hand, you've got social entrepreneurship, and on the other side, you've got financial profit. And there's a sort of spectrum in between that people here are struggling with. Am I totally on the social entrepreneurship side or am I secretly trying to make big profits? And so you get something called impact investing coming along, which says, well, you know, this is making profits, but nicely. And then how much profit? Well, is it going to be four to five percent or really can I make 20 percent out of microfinance, for instance? Well, that's a very interesting debate that's going on here at this conference. But I have another one, which is it's not bipolar. It's not. It is a bipolar conversation. That's what's wrong with it. It's actually trimodal, because the, one of the pieces that is missing from this whole discussion here at this conference is natural capital. They're talking about social capital and financial capital, and they're missing what underpins wealth creation, which is natural capital. And that's the piece that I'm interested in. I would say that, wouldn't I, because I'm a biologist, and I work in tropical forests. And that natural capital is being eroded away and having huge impacts on the poor, 1.5 billion of the poor who depend on that. So one of the great... Uh, the challenges for social enterprise in the future is how do we translate what is going on at this conference not only to deal with sanitation, microcredit and a lot of health things, but how do we actually make it work for the poor who live in and around these natural capital assets like giant tropical forests that keep our atmosphere clean, provide clean water, underpin energy security with water for hydropower and all these sorts of things. So a concrete example of that, one of the entrepreneurs we've been trying to deal with and I visited um, last September in the Choco jungle in Colombia yeah. is a gold mining company, right. no mercury, they're using plants mm -hmm. to strip the gold out from yeah. the ore, yeah. reforesting artisanal miners yeah. in the middle of the, the Choco rainforest yeah. with massive uh, forest preservation yeah. as a result. But with gold prices so high, the illegal miners and the illegal, illegal massive pressure to go in, chop down this rainforest. The one thing that would be transformational, would be game changing to save the Choco, is of course if there could be some type of forest carbon evaluation, some way to get the carbon benefit that they are creating monetized. And it's, it's an area that I specifically work in because forests are worth more cut down than standing up and that's the coin we need to turn over and make them worth more standing up than cut down. So if you're a poor farmer and a gold digger comes along and you're not getting anyone paying you for your trees, you don't mind. In fact, you're delighted if they say, here's five dollars, go cut that tree. It's the same if you're a poor farmer with beef and you want to clear the land for beef. Uh, and what we need to understand is our connectivity around the world with that process. It's not just a process that's happening in the Amazon, because the things we eat depend on what's coming out of the Amazon. So, for instance, in Europe, where the biggest importer of soy into Europe is, is, is from the Amazon, we're the biggest importer of that, we're the second biggest importer of palm oil. That palm oil goes into cakes, cosmetics, biscuits, it's on your barbecue. And when you eat an all-day British breakfast or something like that, the chicken that laid the egg has probably been fed on soy from the Amazon. The pig that made the bacon has also been fed on soy from the Amazon. This is a global phenomenon. So to solve the problem of how you put a value on forests, you need to look at that entire supply chain and the investors who are driving it. And we're at a, an extraordinary point in history where people have suddenly woke up to the fact that forests are immensely valuable in a new way, not just because of the biodiversity and the people that live there who are fascinating, but 
because of the immense ecosystem services they provide globally. That's a water, carbon cycle, biodiversity, livelihoods, all of this is hugely valuable. The hard problem is, is how to capture that value, translate it into an economic cash flow, and deliver it to the people who are looking after the forests. And, and there are a lot of people working on that right now. We've got five billion on the table as a result of the agreements in Cancun just last December. And a lot of people around are trying to figure that out. But we haven't got there yet. And the carbon market, which might kick in by 2013, 2014, might start to value forests for the very first time in an entirely new way. Thank you very much. Terrific stuff.